good afternoon and welcome to the fourth in a series of programs that we're doing primarily aimed at doctoral students at McCormick uh, taking place this summer. Um, this is the first time that we've done this specific set of topics. How many of you have attended one of these presentations before? Not bad, good, very, very good. We're going to be talking today about a variety of different types of business correspondence that you can expect to generate uh, over the course of your career. And I'm going to focus on probably the two most critical pieces for beginning that process, okay? Uh, a cover letter that you would write to accompany your resume as you, or your CV as you send it off uh, to an employer and the email that you will probably use in order to send this letter, okay? So these two pieces are extremely important. They often travel together. Uh, we don't very often put the letter into an envelope, put a stamp on it, and send it in the mail. Uh, when we do this, it's usually done uh, as a second step in the interest of time. Most of us are preferring to send these things, this form of communication, uh, via email. So we're going to be talking about how these two forms of communication work together. Um, I have an open position on my staff right now looking for an advisor, a career advisor, and when I look at the candidates who have supplied an application and a resume online in the university's system, 90% of them have not sent a cover letter with their resume. As a hiring manager, I can tell you that I read the cover letter first. So what does that tell you about the attrition rate right at the very beginning? Okay? So I look first at those candidates who have submitted both a resume and a cover letter. I look at the two documents. I read both. I give equal weight to both documents. But those who have not sent a cover letter are going to get looked at second or third, or 15th, or 59th, you get the idea, right? So anyone who tells you that in this electronic age, a cover letter is not necessary is giving you bad advice, okay? So we're gonna talk today about why you would write a cover letter and how you would go about it, and then how you would send it and what you would do as follow-up. So it doesn't matter whether you are an undergrad looking for your very first summer internship or you're a doctoral student looking to apply for research funding or for a research position in industry or academia. It doesn't matter. The cover letter is absolutely critical, and it's critical on many, many levels. Your cover letter speaks for you. It's used when you can't be present to hand your CV or your resume to an individual person. So it has to stand in for you. It has to be extremely well crafted in order to do that because it's obviously just this two-dimensional object. It's not the three-dimensional person that you are. It's not going to carry the same inflection. It's not going to carry the same facial features or gestures that you would be able to have. You'd call upon those if you're talking to someone in person. So it has to be able to accomplish many of those same uh, communication devices in just this two-dimensional piece of paper. So it's a very, very powerful instrument, and it has to be extremely well done in order to accomplish all of that. So what are the various things that this cover letter will do? It's going to introduce you. It's also going to serve as a writing sample. Very, very important to understand. Your cover letter is a sample of the sort of business communication that you could be called upon to reproduce if given the opportunity to interact with a client, a customer, a vendor, uh, a supplier, a, a funding source. This is an example of how you represent yourself in writing. So an employer reads this and has a sense of how you communicate in writing. So it, Beyond saying, please hire me, right? It's also telling an employer how you would, down the road, 
represent the employer or the research lab or wherever it is that you're sending this to, they can count on you to represent them in the same way. So it carries that sort of weight as well. It has a lot in common with an elevator pitch, that couple of minutes, anything from a few seconds to a couple of minutes that you have, or you have an opportunity, you're alone with someone who's a key decision maker, and you have that, that length of time that it takes to ride up in the elevator with that person to make some really critical point that's going to cause that person to look at you much more seriously. The letter is very, has many of those same kinds of features in common. So on many levels, it's a necessity. So let's talk a little bit about how you go about preparing to write a cover letter, because it's not just a question of, as, as a novelist said, sitting down and staring at a blank piece of paper until beads of blood form on your forehead, right, or beads of sweat. It's, it requires some preparation. Now, I'm going to use as an example for today's presentation a letter that you might write to a person at Baxter Healthcare. I chose this somewhat at random. Baxter Healthcare happens to be an organization that we have many, many interactions with. Many of you in this room may be interacting with them, either through uh, collaborative research or uh, through projects that they've provided. They have deep relationships with McCormick. So I've chosen Baxter for a minute because I want to talk to you about how critical it is that you speak directly to the company when you're writing this letter, and that every single letter you write must be customized in exactly this kind of way, all right? So you don't put together a cover letter that says, to whom it may concern, photocopy it 50 times and put them in envelopes or send them out in an email blast on a listserv. Every single one of them must be written very carefully. We are not talking about a dissertation here. One page is usually sufficient. So great care is taken to, to research the company or the organization that you're applying to and to customize it to put everything in the context of their needs. So we're going to start by taking a look at Baxter because although I don't have an exact job description here, one can imagine all kinds of internship and full-time opportunities at an organization like Baxter. We're going to start by taking a look. I've, I've jumped ahead from the Baxter homepage to a career page. Uh, if, if you were to look at Baxter's homepage, you would find a link at the top that tells us that they have a career section. And in the career section, there are all kinds of really, really essential pieces of information that you will need to know before you ever even begin to, go, to compose a letter to someone at Baxter. Baxter culture, Baxter careers, how to apply for jobs. Companies today pretty much tell you how to go about it, what to say to them, pretty much tell you what a successful candidate looks like, what's important to them. I chose Baxter for a variety of reasons, but one was because I liked what they had in terms of their culture. Their leadership expectations. They're giving you a language to use, a rubric, if you will, to use when you consider how to take your background, your qualifications, and fit it into the Baxter organization. So they tell you about shared values, competencies, and personal attributes. All right, sound judgment. One does not need to be a PhD candidate to have sound judgment, but we could assume that at this point, being a doctoral candidate means that you probably have exercised a great deal of sound judgment in your lifetime at this point. So they're giving you the language, they're giving you the rubric to use to frame your letter to them. They expect that you will use this, okay? Other things that you can gain from a company's website that will give you a leg up on other candidates, and what I'm telling you today is information that most people don't use. They just don't do it. 90% of the people, as I said, who've applied for this opening on my staff 
did not submit a cover letter. One of the things that a successful person will do in my office is help students write cover letters. If you haven't written one, how do I know you even know how to do it? A little bit of research into the job description that I've posted will tell you that this is one of the things that you would be expected to do, is teach students about writing cover letters. So it's being able to connect your profile with the needs of the organization. In the case of Baxter, they're telling you exactly what they're looking for, especially in terms of soft skills. The other thing uh, that I wanted to show you is that they also, if I can find it, um, I'm sorry, meet our employees. There's an entire section in here about employees, and one of these, I won't take the time to scroll through this bar of, of little candidate faces or employee faces. One of these is a PhD student in biomedical engineering or a PhD graduate. So you can see the full spectrum of people they hire. You can also look at Baxter's operations in other parts of the world and get a similar set of information about the culture in that country, about the people who work in that country, and these are people who made it. They passed the bar and have been employed at Baxter. So using Baxter as an example, let's take a look at what goes into writing a cover letter. Because we're videotaping this, uh, if you have a question, I'm perfectly happy to ask, uh, answer questions as we go along. But if you'll raise your hand, Steve Tilly will bring a microphone to you. We want to make sure that we get the question as well as the answer onto the tape. So if I see your hand, and just give us a minute to get a microphone to you. OK, so I think hopefully we've made it pretty clear that a cover letter is there to speak for you when you're not able to be there yourself. We're going to go through the anatomy of a cover letter, and then we're going to take a look at what it looks like as a whole, and we'll dissect the parts of it. This is at the very top of the letter, you put your return address. This is standard US business format, OK? Your return address. You'll notice that there are a few things missing. Your name is not up here. Your telephone number is not up here. And your email address is not up here. These things will appear at the bottom or at the very end of the letter. So at the very top, we're talking about your, your mailing address. You'll see that we double space. And we add the date that the letter is being generated. And you'll notice that it's being written out. We are not using any sort of shorthand for the letter for the uh, month. Okay. This is the person to whom the letter is going to be written. You'll notice when you look at the letter itself, there are no bullet points. I, I realized this after I did, did these slides that I had forgotten to go in and take out the bullet points. We have the individual's full name, title, department, the name of the company, the address, street, city, state, and zip. We then double space, and this is the appropriate salutation. Now, I know Justin. He's a graduate of the BSMS program in biomedical engineering from McCormick. So he is Mr. Rohde. He would be Dr. Rohde if he finished his PhD. Okay? So it's always that sort of combination. And you'll notice we finish the salutation with a colon. These little things matter. Okay? They sound like they are minutia, that they, you know, what difference does it make if it's a colon or a semicolon? If you apply for a position at a consulting firm, I can tell you that a semicolon here will result in your being rejected. You go into the dead letter file, that's it. End of the road for you. Some companies may be a little bit more lenient, but some industry sectors will absolutely not consider you if you violate some of these simplest pr uh, principles. So again, if, if an interview is like a dress rehearsal, this is what I would look like if you put me in front of a client, the letter is an example of how you will represent them in writing. First paragraph is always where you introduce yourself. 
There is a theme I'm going to stress throughout all elements of this presentation today. And that is that it's how you will help them. How you will help them. So you, first you have to introduce yourself. You have to say, I'm, you know, this is who I am, and this is why I'm knocking at your door. This is why I'm sending you this letter. As a doctoral candidate in Northwestern University's biomedical engineering program, I am very interested in pursuing an internship opportunity with Baxter Healthcare for the summer of 2011. This is, I'm, this is why I'm writing to you. You could insert in here the name of the person who referred you or how you learned about the position, but essentially that's the beginning. Combining my academic and research program at Northwestern with the experience of the workplace will prepare me to make a real contribution to Baxter. I'll, I'll help you. Not this will be good for me. Okay? That, that this will be good for me message creeps in in very, very subtle ways. You want to really make sure that you purge your, your letter of any such message. It's all about them. Second paragraph. Now you really begin to focus on them. This may not be the most elegant prose. You can probably do a great deal better. I was writing this to be as general as possible. Well, researching Baxter Healthcare, okay, I have been most intrigued by the progress the company has made in the field of infusion therapy. This is real, okay? I've learned this. I know this because of Justin, but you will know it because you researched Baxter very, very thoroughly, okay? The strides made by Baxter to bring dialysis into the homes of patients suffering from diabetes and other debilitating blood-related illnesses such as MDS have greatly improved the quality of their life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You get this from the mission statement, the philosophy that comes across, the wording that's communicated in the culture. Culture is extremely important. Values are extremely important a sense of shared values, aligning your values with theirs. Okay, third paragraph. Now you get to say why they should consider you. Okay, you've introduced yourself, you've, you've made the case that you understand what it is they do. Now why should they consider you? Well, because in my research, this is where you begin to tie your qualifications, your accomplishments to what it is that they need. Uh, I became aware of the importance of user-centered design that Baxter is known for, et cetera, et cetera. This is where you tie your qualifications to their needs. And you try to talk as much as you can about accomplishments, very specific accomplishments from your own experience. Relate it to your research work, relate it to work you've done in other parts of your life, it does not all have to come from the lab, but after all, you're in a PhD program, your research, your, your work is what will differentiate you from other candidates. This is the place to talk about it, okay? Any questions so far? Most cover letters don't do this, but I can guarantee you that those that do are the ones that are going to be, you know, they're going to make it to the next level. So now you have to close the deal. Now you want to leave with a, a fourth paragraph. And you'll notice when you look at the sample letter, none of these paragraphs are terribly long. They're all on one page. I believe that my skills, interests, and abilities, along with my passion for providing engineering solutions for real human challenges will make me a valuable addition to Baxter Healthcare. Again, I'm contributing. Nowhere in here does it say that this opportunity will be really great for my career. It's a given. It's understood that this will be a good opportunity for your career. But this is not the place to state that. Okay? It is through this internship opportunity that I will learn from some of the best engineers in healthcare today. That's about as far as you should go in, in explaining what you think you would get from this opportunity. Thank you for considering my request for an interview, and I look forward to hearing from you. I can be reached at, and here's where you insert your email and your telephone number. Now, you know, not that many years ago, this would have been a landline. And then we went through a transition period where we had to say, you can reach me on my mobile at, it's just assumed today that that 
number is probably your mobile. And you don't need to say anything more about it. There's nothing wrong with coming right out and saying, I am looking for an opportunity to interview. Okay? I really want seriously to be considered for this position. There's nothing wrong in talking about your enthusiasm, your passion, your interest in this. That, this is some, an added advantage of writing a cover letter. You can't necessarily put that in a resume or a CV, but you certainly can in a cover letter. Your passion, your interest, your enthusiasm, your sense of shared values, all of those things are really critical to the success of a cover letter. Any questions? How many of you have written cover letters before? Yes? Steve, uh, why, don't, why don't we do this? Oh, OK. So the first hand that I saw was your hand, the gentleman at the end of this row. Would you care to comment on the approach that you took in your letter? And, and uh, did you hear from the company? I don't remember too much about what I put in the cover letter, but I did get the internship. So good that for you. Good. All right. But so I something you said resonated with them. OK. How about there were a couple of hands that went up over here. Other experiences with writing a cover letter? Someone else? How many of you have sent cover letters only to feel like they just fall into dead space? Yeah, that can happen. So one of the things, uh, before we go into how you get it to people, where let's close off with the letter. Let's take a look at the email that would accompany this, or probably the fastest way to get it into the hands of, of a uh, hiring manager. We close with a signature. This, is, this needs to be a written signature. Okay? Now, obviously, if we're sending this letter via email, the best thing to do is to sign the letter, you know, print it, sign it, scan it, and email it as a PDF with your original signature on it. If you can't do that, I do recommend that you then send the letter by mail. Right? If, if you don't have access to scanning and and all of that, then do go ahead, send it by email without the signature, but then mail a copy of it. Why is that? This letter is the first in a chain of actual correspondence that forms a contractual relationship between you and this company. You are taking the first step in a chain that will ultimately become very, very formal, and letters are an essential part of that chain. So you're taking the first step. You are indicating an interest in being considered. Follow-up correspondence from the company could come in the form of an offer letter. We'll get to that in a minute. OK, signature. We're attaching a resume in this email. It's very comparable to mailing both the cover letter and a resume in a business envelope and sending the two. So we still have leftover from kind of the old days of doing this by post. Uh, to use an abbreviation, ENCL. If you have more than one document, it would be ENCLS, enclosure or enclosure. So the first enclosure is a resume. Now, it's obviously a t an attachment if we're talking about the email transmission. But as I say, we still sort of borrow from the old language. Now, you will find, oh, so you identify the enclosure. It's a resume, OK? You will find many companies, and I think Mark Worworth talked about this before, where they want to know what your salary expectations or your salary history uh, would be or have been. We recommend that you do not include the salary history. Mark probably emphasized this point. Uh, that is up to you, but if you choose to add it, then this is where it would go. You would, you would say salary history. It would be a, sec a separate document. Again, we don't recommend that you do this. You're giving away a lot of your negotiating power as soon as you do it. Do not include references unless you've already agreed with the employer. You've had some communication with this employer. And they're asking, especially in the interest of speed, 
to try to get as much submitted as possible. Then you would submit a separate document with your references listed on it and all of their contact information. So in that case, you could possibly include references as the name of a, a second document that you're enclosing. CC also goes back to the old days. Uh, nobody here will remember carbon paper. But we called, when we typed on a typewriter uh, and with a, carbon co a piece of carbon paper and another piece of blank paper behind it, that carbon copy would be sent to someone else. So the carbon copy would be sent to whoever else needs to be kept in the loop. So you have some discretion here. We, we sometimes refer to this as courtesy copy now. But CC, colon, double space, and the name of the person you are copying on that letter, just as if you were copying someone on an email. The name of the person referring you might be, it might be appropriate to put here. The name of someone you spoke with at the company, someone in your network who suggested that you talk to this company. Uh, what you're signaling here by putting this at the bottom of the letter is you're letting the recipient of the letter know that you have actually shared this information with someone else. It's a form of protocol. It's a form of etiquette. Just as you compose emails and you think carefully about who you send a CC to or a BCC, right? So if I want to send something to the dean, I need to let my boss know that I'm communicating with the dean. He doesn't want to be surprised. So you can do a courtesy copy to anyone else you think might need to be aware of your application. So someone you know, your contact within the company, you want to let them know that you've actually taken this formal step of applying, and so you would CC this person. And that's pretty much it. That's, that's the basis of the letter. Again, it's finding uh, more informal ways of communicating your enthusiasm and your fit for this position. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, back there. You're talking about sending this as a, scanning it, sending it as a PDF. Um, and then you have your enclosed documents. Do you want to have those within the same PDF or have them as two separate attachments to the email? That's a great question. Um, very often, and, and this brings up an opportunity to talk about something uh, related, very often you are t being told to submit these documents online. You're applying in their online employment database, right? And one of the things that you need to do is follow their instructions to the letter. So if they say, attach your resume here and your cover letter here, then you would clearly need to send these as two separate documents. If, if this is in the online application context now, that's where that kind of instruction really matters. We do that at the university. We have, there are two separate ways to attach or upload these documents. If you're going to, uh, if, if they say upload your cover letter and resume here, then clearly one page is fine. Now, when we do these as a PDF, one of the problems with the resume as a PDF is that it now cannot be used as a search document. So if you're applying online, my recommendation is, again, you know, read those instructions very, very carefully. If you have the opportunity to upload your document as either a plain text file or a Word document, I would do it. Because companies use a keyword search function looking for candidates. Okay? They're also doing that on LinkedIn. Uh, we had an employer at, a, at an event that we held back in April, and he told us that he found his last two very high profile hires by searching uh, on LinkedIn. So you want to be very sensitive to the, to the uh, possibility that a keyword search is going to be applied to your resume. And that's not going to happen with a PDF. But if, if you have this option of sending it uh, as one document, yes, it's OK to do that. Okay. There was another question over here. Yep. So we'll, we'll get you next. Hello. 
<clears throat> How about naming the files? Are there any conventions for what yes. you would title? Yes, great question. The name of the file, especially if it goes as an attachment, is going to be visible to the employer. So to simply say my resume or my cover letter is not a good idea. Okay? You want to be able to name it um, John Smith cover letter for Baxter Healthcare. It also reduces the risk that that same cover letter is going to sent, be sent by mistake to Abbott, right? Or Pfizer or whatever. So naming your document with your name and the name of the company is a wise move. Otherwise, you do run into the possibility that they're looking at this as a generic document that you're sending out to you know, many, many different companies, many, many different organizations. So giving it a unique file name also helps the employer who then goes to move that to a file folder in their system. It's appropriately named. Great question. I think we had another question back here. So going back to um, applying for a job online, what if you're uploading your cover letter and say it's a big company and you don't have a specific contact, like this letter is addressed to a specific right. person in a group, then what would you do about that? How do you go about finding someone or how do you address it? If you're looking at, uh, well, uh, let me go back to my experience as a hiring manager. When I open uh, resumes and cover letters that have been submitted online for my open position and I see my name in there, I know that the person has gone to our website and has learned that I'm the director, even though they're sending it. That kind of information is rarely available today. Uh, you're not going to get a name from Baxter. And you can do all this networking. We can help you with our contacts. You know, we can give you Justin's name and, and contact information. But this application was this cover letter was being written for a position that he was hiring for, right? Your question's an extremely good one. When you're applying to something that is available online and that's all the information that you have, then to say to whom it may concern is perfectly appropriate. It's, it's never quite as good as having the hiring manager's name, but we recognize the fact that sometimes there's no way, and you don't want to wait. You want to be able to respond quickly. Now, what does help is if through your networking you can find someone who does work there, right, through the Northwestern University online directory, through LinkedIn, through networking with friends, colleagues. There are all kinds of ways of getting names. And then going through that person to see if you can find the name of the recruiter or the, the person who in human resources who will give these resumes a first pass. It's always better, but sometimes you just have your back against the wall and you have to use that more general term. I think we had another question over here. Mm -hmm. um, you suggested that we use the language, as it were, that they put up on the website. Um, they say, you know, they'll, they'll use specific terms. Does it, do you run into the danger of seeming like you're just parroting what they're saying? You or? would think so. You would think so, but let me give you an example from, uh, it, you can even include the language from a job description. I mean, be even that much more specific, and it works. I, I don't know what, it, I don't know whether it's that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery or, or what, <coughs> but it does work. Uh, we had a student who was doing an internship with Boeing, I'm sorry, with in, uh, Intel. She made the switch to Boeing for a full-time job, she was telling me that she wanted to go for another job within the company, and someone said to her, take the language of the job description and embed it in your cover letter, and she did, and she got hired for that position. It works. I, it's like, again, it's the key word search. Our intellect tells us that's a really narrow way of going about things, but you know, it is successful. Any other questions back here? <coughs> uh, you'd mentioned that uh, the keyword search when they're going through these databases is very important. Um, mm -hmm. So if we can, it would be nice to use a Word document or something that's searchable. But it also is good to have your signature on the 
page. So how do you kind of reconcile those two things? If I had to choose between, I, again, I go back to when the online instructions tell you apply this way, you know what your choices are. I, I think whenever you, you have the opportunity, use it as a Word document and then mail the one with the formal signature on it. But if you don't, if that's not a realistic opportunity, then just send the PDF. So the PDF, if you can only do one, is better? Um, I'm not, well, every situation is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sounds kind of confusing, but every situation is going to be a little bit different. You always start with the instructions that they give you. Okay? Okay, thanks. Anybody else? So I did want to spend a couple of minutes talking oops, about uh, the email. <clears throat> and if it's not in these. Well, it did not get picked up in this iteration of the slides, but I have on the back of I probably saved this presentation twice, and the second time didn't save it with the email attachment. <clears throat> On the back of the handouts, you'll see, and this is quite small, uh, we will post all of these to our website. The, the other presentations are up there already. So we'll have these on, on the McCormick Office of Career Development. But if you can read that very tiny print, uh, this is a very brief email summary of the most salient points of the cover letter. And it says, attached, you'll find my resume and my formal cover letter. This is one more opportunity to reinforce the message that you want to make, the point you want to get across. Okay? This is not the letter itself. Some people ask, is it OK to just send the letter in the body of an email? It does not carry the same impact. It just doesn't, OK? You might think, well, it's, why not? Why go to the trouble of having a separate document? This document is going to get uploaded into their online application system. It's, it's going to be viewed as a document. And you don't really want just the email representation speaking for you. Any other questions? So. This letter is so well done, and it's, it is so successful that you wind up with the interview or the internship, even better, right? So the next document that you're going to write after you've interviewed is a thank you letter. You will follow the same kind of block style formatting, right, if you write a formal thank you letter. You have three choices. The first is to send a formal letter. The second is to send an email. And the third is to send a handwritten card. Which one, a handwritten note, which one do you think would be the most effective? If you had to choose, what would you do? The handwritten note. Why? more individualized, it's more personalized, the person feels you've devoted additional time. That contradicts what we were thinking before that this, you know, just this matching of words will get us to that successful point. But this is the exact reason why at some point that personal connection, that personally handwritten note is the most effective of the three. Yes. So um, the issue that I can foresee with handwritten notes is that, so you have to mail this to someone. And say you interview today, I thought the idea is to, whilst that person either still remembers you or you don't have this lag because it could get lost or something could happen. So in that circumstance, is it OK to do the email and the handwritten note? Or does it not really matter at yes. that stage? Yes. Combined with the email, which gives you the advantage of speed, and the handwritten note, which is that added personal touch. Yes, the best approach. Yes. Uh, Steve. Hi. Just a little tidbit to answer that. Some people think um, 
they need to mail it, a suggestion I give to students is bring a thank you card with you in advance. And then when you're leaving an interview or, or anything like that, drop it off at the receptionist as you leave right. and have them give it to you. So then you get that immediate impact on the handwritten note. So that's kind of a suggestion I give to students. The only thing that doesn't allow you to do is to insert a comment into the handwritten note about something specific that took place in the interview itself. So perhaps a compromise is have the, hundred, have the note, have the paper or the card, take a moment in the reception area before you leave to sit down and write out the note. This is that opportunity to, to all of a sudden reinforce something that you forgot to mention or that, that you really want to call attention to. But either way, I think, yes, that, that's a great idea is be prepared to do it right away. It does carry immediate impact. I, I will tell you that, again, if very few people have submitted cover letters, even fewer people write thank you notes or cards. We, we say this all the time, but it seldom gets done. You know, life has a way of just carrying us along so quickly that uh, we just move on to the next thing. But you miss an opportunity if you don't do it. There, there's another form of written communication which you may find yourself needing to write. Uh, let's say that, we'll come to that in a second, the, the next document, the next letter that gets written is by the company and it comes to you in the form of an offer. Should you expect to get a rejection letter today? Not going to happen. Don't let your heart be broken. They don't have the time. Companies today, especially because of the online application environment, receive hundreds if not thousands of unsolicited applications every week. There's no way they can send them. So you've put all this care into a personally crafted cover letter and you hear nothing. Don't expect to get a rejection letter. We used to, we used to get rejection letters, nicely written on company letterhead with this very sweet, consoling message. Not gonna happen. Okay? Just a, a fact of modern life. I want to leave you with one other kind of letter that, as I said, you might find yourself needing to write. And it's an essential piece of this chain of communication. And it's the letter you write when you need to leave the organization. It's a letter of resignation. Following the same block style, one of the things that's different about a letter of resignation is its brevity, really brief. And it does not need to detail reasons why you have chosen to leave. That, at that point then, that is not that company's business any longer. But that you take the position that you are very grateful for the opportunity to have been there and you thank them profusely and you simply let them know you will be leaving. Most companies can't even begin to the process of replacing you until they get that letter. So letters play an important part in this relationship. Even though we live in a world of fast-paced uh, internet communications, online applications, and so on, this just still remains an essential part of this relationship. And you had a question. So once you've put in your cover letter and the process is working. So you said you don't receive anything back from them. So what's the appropriate means of following up with HR Great or whatever? Great question. So if you have the name of the person, a follow-up email, give them time. I, I can tell you one of the worst things as a hiring manager is to be badgered by applicants. This, this does not work in your favor, okay? <laughs> it will backfire on you. So after an appropriate length of time, and it could be a week, two weeks, a follow-up email. And, oh, and one thing that you should know is if you do send your, your cover letter and resume to an individual at a company, ask in your email, set it up so you get a return receipt. They don't always get there. You know, we assume that this is the, all of these systems are fail-safe, right? They're, they're just foolproof. They're, you write something and you send it by email, of course it got there. 
No, sometimes they don't get there. This morning in my husband's email inbox was an invitation to my, my high school class reunion. At the time that I was there, I didn't have his last name. How did he get that email? So things don't always get where they're supposed to go. So send, ask for a return receipt. So the person reading this, if you're sending it to an individual, will check that and you will know that it got there. Okay? But a follow-up, a good follow-up is to say, I'm just checking to see if you got my materials. The second thing that you can ask is, can you share with me any information that you might have about the timeline for the decision? To inquire about the timeline is not the same thing as saying, well, are you going to hire me or not? And you, the other thing to keep in mind, along with the idea that you're not going to get a rejection letter, is that they are dealing with hundreds of tasks your application is not the most critical thing in their life at the moment. It might be for you. This application may mean the world to you. But to them, they are extremely busy. And they're, they'll get to it. But it will be at a timeline that you probably will think is too prolonged. It can be kind of painful waiting. So any other questions? I did want to close with a message that um, from my office about this idea of resigning from a position. Hand in hand with that is this very awful decision that you might have to make that you've accepted a position. You've gone through all this, you've accepted a position, and a better position comes along. What do you do? What do you do? If you simply turn your back on the first employer whose job you expect, uh, accepted, this is known as reneging. To renege on an offer means you've said yes, and now you turn around and you say no. It's treated very, very seriously in some contexts. If you find yourself in a situation where you must change your mind, you must take the second offer, Treat it as you would a resignation. Treat it as you would a resignation. Don't burn bridges. We don't want to see you have to do this. It's considered to be unethical, unprofessional, very bad judgment. But there may come a time in your life when you must do it. Treat it like a resignation. And the other thing that I would say is that when you're looking at this career development in the context of a network that you're developing, don't forget to take into account the fact that your university is a part of your network. Okay? So if you contacted Justin, you applied for a position at Baxter, and Justin was with you all the way, every step of the way in this process, Baxter offers you a position. Abbott makes you a more attractive offer. You walk away from Baxter and you go to Abbott. That does great damage to the McCormick brand and to your own brand. So how, if you have to do it, just make sure that you do it very, very professionally. We just went through a very tortured experience with an employer and a recent grad. So I, this is very fresh in our mind. Good advice. Treat it as you would a resignation and do so taking into account all the people who need to be notified. Yes. And hopefully you won't ever have that situation. Yeah, what's an, an appropriate amount of time to give an employer? Obviously, like I've heard the two weeks notice, but I mean, what's, is that appropriate? I mean, can you give less? Should you give more depending upon the position? Yeah. Generally, we consider professional positions, uh, those for which you need a degree. I, that, that's not a hard and fast rule, but generally like to think of a month, okay? Um, two weeks is kind of on the limit of being acceptable. If I were to leave and to give the dean one month's notice, that would be considered appropriate. The more time, the better, okay? The, so the higher ranking your position is, the more difficult it might be to find a replacement, the more time you want to give them. Uh, two weeks is sort of the threshold. 
For positions, and this isn't going to affect you, but for positions below that level, you know, a week. But really, two weeks is kind of the threshold. Lower than that, it's, you, it kind of leaves a bad taste in the employer's mouth. Unless, of course, there's been some big life change and can't be helped. Any other questions about, yes, can, Steve will bring the mic to you. Kind of back to what you're talking about in terms of getting offers. So are you able to kind of push for more time as to whether or not you have to make your decision if you are waiting, let's say, to hear back from what you think is your more preferred job, but you haven't heard back, so you don't want to end up in the position you're right, talking about? Right, right. Yes, yeah, so we see this, we see this occasionally during the, the recruiting season. A student will have had an interview, they have an offer from their second or third choice company, but they've interviewed or they have an interview coming up with their ideal job. It's, it's best to see if you can't ask for a little bit more time before making a decision. And it's okay to say to an employer, I've committed to a round of interviews that go out through the end of you know, the month. In order to make sure that I'm making the best possible decision for you and for me, I'd like to ask for a little bit of an extension. There, as the economy heats up, and it seems to be taking quite a while to heat up, but as it heats up, we'll see more pressure being put on candidates to accept in a very short period of time. If you ever have any questions about how to handle that, please come and see us because we work with those kinds of issues all the time. We'd be happy to give you some advice. Okay, any other questions about anything related to this kind of communication or offers in general? We're gonna be covering more of this later in the summer. So our next session is in two weeks, correct? Okay. All of the workshops are on our website as well as all of the materials following the presentation. So, great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.